Welcome back. Our first panel discussion will be focusing on the white paper about supporting vision research. As I'm Doug Earl, I'm president and CEO of Fighting Blindness Canada. It's our, my honor to host this panel, to be the moderator. Uh, we'll be hearing from each of our three panelists and then provide an opportunity for questions and discussion from you, our participants in the room. We really appreciate your feedback. We collected well over 300 opinions, uh, points uh, around vision research and uh, the other two papers to put together the draft that we shared with Canadians on January 16th and invited them to provide feedback, whether or not we had hit the right note, whether we had captured their thoughts and for them to provide further information, dialogue uh, around the issues raised in the white paper. There were three main points that came from that dialogue with Canadians online through our website. First, there was real hope and optimism as research has delivered treatments such as the anti-VEGF treatments in, that came to Canada in 2006 that has stabilized the site for tens of thousands of Canadians across our country. And for the innovative treatments that are on the horizon as we wait as a community for the first restorative treatment that Health Canada is entertaining an application for Lexterna, which is using gene therapy to replace a non-functioning gene with a functioning gene that produces a protein that has amazing success in being able to restore sight, a degree of sight, for people living with that dysfunctioning gene. The second point that was raised by the feedback was that there is a, com a complete lack of support, sufficient support for our vision research community. Many pointed out the fact that there is not an institute at the Canadian Institutes of Health Research. Many pointed out there is not a panel that vision research could apply to. There are 48 panels at CIHR, but not one of them is solely dedicated to uh, vision. Yet, there are 1.5 million Canadians living with vision loss, and there is 5.59 million living with an eye condition that puts them at significant risk of losing their sight. And the simple fact, as we found out in the StatsCan most recent study, that, that the number of people living with vision loss has tripled in the last decade. As CHR is looking at its new strategic plan, we have an opportunity to talk about diseases of the aging, and vision has to be put on the agenda and has to receive the funding it deserves in order to support the amazing research discoveries, translation into clinical trials, and new treatments that Lexterna, our first targeted gene therapy for ocular disease, is promising. And all of the clinical trials and research underway in, in discovery labs around the country offer the hope to follow. The third point that came from the feedback was that we had to keep Canada in the game. And that was described by a couple of points. First, we have to inspire a new generation, the next generation of vision researchers. Whether it be those rare, passionate people that, that want to have their MD and practice in the clinic and spend more than half their time in the lab from what they see with working with patients each week and trying to understand why it's happening through their research. To the basic scientists that, that lead the discovery 
around the country and the world. The second point about keeping Canada in the game that was raised was the urgent need to ensure Canadians can have access at the earliest stages of treatment development by having Canada participate in clinical trials, the phase one, two, three process by which treatments get approved. Luxterna was approved by the United States in 2017 and Europe in 2018. The first phase one trial for Luxterna happened well over eight years ago, yet Canadians are still waiting for access to this innovative treatment that restores their sight if they have that gene. We need to change that, was what people told us through the feedback to our draft papers. The third point that was raised is that we need to do more in understanding vision loss in Canada. That we do not have the, the depth of health population research that other countries do. And many of the stats that we use today to talk about vision loss in the country is actually research done in other parts of the world that we try to apply as an estimate in the Canadian context. And so much of public policy, so much of decisions about healthcare delivery depend on health population research. And if we are to keep Canada in the game, whether it be inspiring the next generation of researchers, getting involved in the earliest stages of clinical trials, and inspiring health population research, this supports an ecosystem where people who are dedicating their lives to understand vision loss and developing new treatments going through the clinical trial process that it can actually reach people in a clinic as the standard of care is why we're here today to discuss, to talk about supporting vision research in Canada. So I'm very pleased and honored to be joined by three of our panelists here with uh, Dr. Michelle Kayat, who's the chair of the Scientific Advisory Board for Fighting Blindness Canada, and a researcher and director of the Cellular Neurobiology Research Unit in Montreal for the Clinical Research Institute. Stuart Morris, who's the senior analyst for the Canadian Survey of Disability at Stats Canada. And Dr. Catherine Safidis, who's a senior scientist for the neuroscience program at the Ottawa Hospital Research Institute and an associate professor at the University of Ottawa. So I'd like to call upon Michelle, if you'd like to start us off with a discussion. Thank you very much, Doug. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, bonjour à tous. Uh, C'est vraiment, ça fait plaisir de voir un si grand nombre de personnes uh, intéressées uh, à la cause de, uh, des problèmes de vision. Um, alors, uh, aujourd'hui, ce que j'ai pensé faire, c'est discuter surtout des problèmes de financement en recherche. Uh, je vais parler surtout de ce qui se passe au Canada et je vais essayer de le comparer un peu avec... Uh, qu'est-ce qu'on observe ailleurs et surtout aux États-Unis, et peut-être comment on pourrait remédier à certains des problèmes qui ont lieu présentement au Canada pour financer la recherche en vision. Je vais faire le, le, le reste de la présentation en anglais, mais je, je tenais à faire un petit un intro en français parce qu'apparemment, il y a des gens qui traduisent, donc je me suis dit que j'allais les faire travailler un peu aujourd'hui. So, uh, uh, thank you for being here. Uh, I think one of the uh, main challenge that we have, as I uh, mentioned, the slides are not working. Uh, is it? Oh, yeah. Okay, oops. Okay, I went too fast. Oh, this one's not working. Okay, that's fine. It doesn't matter. It's, it was uh, about some statistics about vision loss. And uh, Doug just gave you all the statistics. I think we can all agree that um, uh, vision loss is a major problem in Canada and around the world, uh, especially with the aging population. Uh, we're going to be facing an epidemic in the coming years. Uh, uh, there's more and more people affected with vision loss. Uh, and therefore, I think, as a scientist and a researcher, uh, that research is really the key. We must invest massively in research uh, to try to get 
and identify new cures uh, for vision loss. Um, and one way in which, and other countries have, have recognized this, uh, the importance of this. Uh, oops, uh, oh, it was working. Ah, okay, there you go. <laughs> uh, so other countries have recognized the importance of, of uh, funding uh, vision research. One of them is the United States, uh, our neighbors. Uh, and uh, research in the USA is mostly funded, or health research, is mostly funded through the National Institute of Health, NIH, uh, which is composed of 22 different institutes that you can see here on the slide. If you can't see them, it doesn't matter. I'll, I'll, I'll summarize that for you. The idea is that each different institute is uh, focusing on a specific topic. For example, there's an, a, an insti National Cancer Institute, there's a National Institute of Drug Abuse, and so on and so forth. All of these different topics, uh, research topics, are represented in the NIH portfolio. One of those institutes, and I uh, highlighted it here in red, is the National Eye Institute. So all vision scientists in the USA have ha access to the National Eye Institute for their main funding uh, to fund their research program. So they apply and submit their project to the National Eye Institute, who will then look at the project, evaluate uh, uh, how promising they are and how strong they are compared to all the other applications received. And, uh, and then they have a dedicated, the National Eye Institute has a dedicated budget, uh, which is uh, very significant of several hundred million dollars, uh, which is uh, uh, more than our whole CHR. Uh, obviously, the USA is, is larger, uh, but what the, my point here is that there is the National Eye Institute in the USA. Here, as Doug mentioned, uh, in Canada, uh, health research is mostly funded through the Canadian Institute of Health Research, or uh, the Institut de Recherche en Santé du Canada. Uh, there are also different institutes at, at CIHR, as you can see here. There's the uh, Gender and Health Institute, the Nutrition, Metabolism, and Diabetes Institute, the Cancer Research Institute, the Genetics Institute, Aging, Neuroscience, and Mental Health, but there is no eye institute or vision institute. This means that uh, vision research is not very well represented at, at the national level at CIHR. I think we must do something about this. Uh, I'm personally uh, working hard in trying to, to uh, talk to people at the national level and tell them the importance of vision research. Uh, as Doug mentioned, there are no specific panels that are dedicated to evaluate uh, vision research. Uh, our, our grant submissions go to panels that are normally mostly neuroscience related. Uh, and so uh, this often means that there are not really specific expertise in the panel to evaluate our, our research projects. So this can cause some problems. So uh, perhaps one possible uh, solution to this, aside from convincing the federal government to actually fund uh, vision research through CIHR with the specific institute, uh, is, is to develop provincial programs. And this is what we have done uh, in Quebec uh, with the Fonds de recherche en santé du Québec. Uh, so I'm a director of the uh, Vision Health Research Network which is a, a network of, of scientists and researchers and clinicians, uh, 126 different researchers and, and almost 200 graduate students and residents that are part of this network. And as you can see here, the network is, is basically addressing all sorts of important uh, uh, questions in vision research, going from cornea, anterior segment, uh, retina and posterior segment, brain and perception, and rehabilitation and low vision. So uh, the idea of the network is to bring uh, 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 scientists together uh, who are all interested in vision research and develop and, and getting them the support that they need to perform their, their research. And, and the support means funding specific research programs. For example, the we have a 
RNI, which is a Réseautage National et International, which, which is a networking uh, grant application for people who have projects in collaboration with other scientists across Canada or even internationally. Uh, so there is a, a specific re uh, funding program for that. We also offer uh, support for infrastructures, uh, for example, tissue bank uh, and databases and so on. Uh, we have an annual research day where people come and present their work and so that we find out what other people in the province actually do related to vision research and sometimes develop collaboration. We have all sorts of partnership, one of them recently with Fighting Blindness Canada, all sorts of excellence prizes for graduate students, and we were talking about developing the next generation of vision scientists. This is one of the programs that's helping achieve that. Um, and then we also fund uh, specific uh, research, such as uh, AMD research, and we also provide support for clinical research. So all of this is the idea is to provide at the provincial level, since we don't have that mechanism at the federal level, at the provincial level, at least we can have some sort of uh, uh, organization around a specific topic that is vision research that we all uh, care about so much. And so this is done in Quebec through the Fonds de Recherche en Santé du Québec. But uh, I, there are more and more interest to develop similar initiatives across Canada in different provinces. I know in Alberta there's a small network like this as well. Uh, it's nowhere near as, as large as this network, but it's coming and, and people are getting together and developing these networks. And I think it's, it's a very important and, and a potentially uh, promising uh, way to support vision research. And I think that is something we should perhaps discuss. So thank you. Don't need to turn this on. Let's let's check the microphone. Uh, am I coming through loud and clear on this? Uh, I can never tell. Uh, the reason being is uh, I'm actually hard of hearing myself, and uh, so clearly um, disability research is very near and dear to my heart. Um, it's something that I've done for the past 20 years, uh, both uh, in uh, academics as well as in the different agencies here in the uh, federal government. So. Given that I don't have a lot of time, um, I thought that I'm just going to touch briefly on some of the following topics. So the things I'm going to be talking about is, what is the Canadian Survey on Disability? And so now I'm going to call it the CSD for short. Um, how do we define disability? How often is the survey conducted? And what disability types are covered? And what are some of the main topic areas? And then, if I have time, I'd like to touch briefly on some of the high-level findings of what we found specifically to do with persons with seeing disabilities. So let's start with an overview. So most may not know this, but um, disability uh, research in Canada has been collected for the past 35 years. Um, in that time, uh, we've seen that the way that we define disability, how it is measured, and also seeing how the technological advances has evolved over time. So what we're seeing is not something that is static, but something that is dynamic, it's changing. And the way that we define it has been changing over time, but the way that technology has been introduced into lives of persons with disabilities is changing at the same time. So what is the Canadian Survey on Disability? Well, it's a national survey of Canadians aged 15 years and over whose everyday activities are limited because of a long-term condition or health-related problem. It's a survey that's conducted uh, jointly by Statistics Canada and Employment and Social Development Canada and provides reliable data on persons with disabilities not only for each province and, and territory, uh, so we get province, territory, Canada-wide, but we also get it by different age groups. Um, Now, we get into how do we define disability? So what's happened in time is we've seen a shift in the way that we define disability. So once upon a time, it was focused on the medical model. And the medical model said that simply the presence of the condition meant that you have a disability. So using me as an example, um, I have a hearing loss, therefore I have a disability. We now switch now to what's called a social model of disability. And the idea is that you not only have to have a condition,
but that also has to result in some type of limitation. So using me as an example again, um, I have a condition which is hearing loss, but if I'm in a fully accessible environment, which includes my hearing aids, if I have speech to text technology or, or anything that I may need personally, I may myself may not have a disability because I don't find it limiting in my day-to-day -day activities. So that's a really important distinction to make. Um, now, how often is the uh, data collected? Um, the CSD is conducted every five years, and it was first introduced in 2012. Uh, the most recent 27 CSD and the next cycle, which will be in 2022, will now be the first time that we can actually track change over time, which is very exciting. In other words, we've got, um, we've got a, a good, solid baseline measure for flagging persons with disabilities that has now been agreed upon. And we're gonna take that same measurement that we used in 2017 and apply it to the 2022. So now what we're gonna be able to see is what's happening over time. Are the rates going up? Are they going down? What's happening with the introduction of technology and so on? So it's quite an exciting time to be involved in research in the, for, for me, certainly in the uh, social research side. Um, now, what is exactly covered in CSD? Um, we have, we cover not only 10 dis different disability types, um, ranging from vision and hearing, but also the pain and mobility, as well as learning and mental health. Uh, the survey also measures severity levels for each of the disability types. Uh, we cover a number of different topics. Uh, in the survey, we cover use and needs for aids and assist devices, help receive the required, um, therapy and social service supports, education, employment and workplace accommodations, labor market participation, and labor force discrimination. So I've just kind of just touched very briefly on the sort of the broad topics, but if you were to actually go into the survey itself, it's, it's quite extensive and we do capture quite a bit of information on it. So I'm gonna just quickly, do I have time to just kind of give a a quick summary of the findings that we have specific to persons with seeing disabilities. So, as you already know, the estimate that's been quoted um, is 1.5 million uh, in Canada, age 15 years and over, um, have a seeing disability, and that represents about 5.4% of the Canadian population. Um, now, interesting, what most people may not know is that, as is often the case for persons with disabilities, they often have more than one type. It's, I have disability A plus something else. So when we look at persons with seeing disabilities, we see that only 14% of that group have just their seeing disability. 27% have an additional one or two other disability types. And 59% have three or more disability types. So what this is telling us is that oftentimes we can't look at disability in isolation to one particular type we have to collectively think of the impact of what are all these different disability types having on that person's lived experience and trying to isolate what can we say definitively that has to do with one type as opposed to what is a collection of things that are happening. Um, the most commonly occurring disability types are pain related. So 68% of um, persons with seeing also have pain. Uh, 52% also have flexibility, and 50% also have mobility. Uh, in the 2017, very quickly, the first time that we actually get to for each type, asking you not only uh, what was the age at which the disability occurred, but what is the age at which it started limiting. So oftentimes we tend to think that they go hand in hand. Well, my disability occurred at this age, and it limited me right away. Well, actually, what we found is that for those with seeing disability, the average age was 35 years. But when it actually started to impact their lived experience, wasn't until the age of 43. And from my own analysis, looking at different disability types, persons with seeing have the longest lag time from uh, onset to limitation. Whereas something like, for example, persons with uh, pain uh, or mobility is around two years. So it's a much shorter period of time. So I found that quite interesting. Uh, lastly, I'll just, if I have time, one last final statistic um, is that um, 
Not surprisingly, the most commonly used aids or assist devices um, are eyeglasses or contact lenses, so that's 77%. 25% uh, use magnifiers, and 18% use large print reading material. Um, and then on the other end, 4% uh, use a white cane or identification cane. Um, but what I found interesting and what the data is saying is that um, uh, less than 1% use Braille. Now, what may be happening there is, and I need to look at it more, is that as we're seeing technology improve, we're seeing the use more of electronic information in there. So, um, as I say, uh, I can't do it justice in 10 minutes, but I thought I would just give a sort of a snapshot of what we found so far. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Kathy Tsilfidis, um, and I'm a scientist here at the Ottawa Hospital Research Institute and at the University of Ottawa. So for my 10 minutes, I was asked to talk um, a little bit about the findings of the white paper on, on vision research um, and some of the promise of research and also some of the challenges. Uh, so many of you have heard about um, what has been happening lately in the, in the field of research and vision, and there are a lot of exciting things um, that are happening. Um, there's, there's lots to be encouraged about. Um, some of the... Uh, the, the the things that have made the news uh, recently are um, obviously uh, gene therapy and Luxturna in, in particular. Um, and so I think we've, we've actually turned a corner in terms of uh, the acceptance of gene therapy for the treatment um, of visual disorders based on the success of the Luxturna trials. Um, there are additional trials right now, um, clinical trials, that uh, where they are testing additional gene therapies um, for diseases such as choroideremia, um, for achromatopsia, for Stargardt's disease, which is a juvenile form of AMD. Um, and, um, and so I think we will see an explosion um, in the field of gene therapy over the, over the coming years, um, simply because the Luxterna trials showed that gene therapy is safe and it is effective. Um, we have other things to be excited about. Um, CRISPR technology, some of you have, may have heard about. And so this is a technology that can be used to actually go in and edit the DNA. Um, it is still in the experimental stages right now, and so it has only been tested in animal models of retinal disease, um, but it has been tested in several models of retinitis pigmentosa, and in the animals it does seem to protect photoreceptors and to... Um, and to um, show uh, slowing down the progression of the disease. And so why, why is, is CRISPR exciting? Um, it's because with all of the gene therapy trials that are going on right now, most of those are being used to treat either X-linked disease or recessive disease. That is when uh, a disease is, you only need one sort of um, mutated copy of the gene in order to have the disease. But, but a good majority of, the, of uh, vision uh, disorders are what are called dominant disease, um, and that is where you only need to inherit one copy of the mutant gene in order to be affected. And those are much more difficult to target with the current technologies of gene therapy. And so CRISPR offers an opportunity to then go in and just basically remove that um, that mutation uh, from the DNA and allow the, the good gene to take over and to, um, to protect the retina. Stem cells are another exciting area of research. Um, we, we still have to realize the full potential of this research, um, and um, stem cells are, are um, are not as advanced as we had hoped even a few years ago um, because more extensive research has shown that we still have a ways to go before we can coax those stem cells into forming new photoreceptors um, or new ganglion cells to, to reform the, the back of the eye, the retina, um, or uh, the optic nerve. Um, but there has been tremendous progress in that area as well. And then there's also been tremendous progress in the fields of assistive technologies. Um, so things like apps on telephones, 
um, uh, magnifiers, uh, cameras that, that can be worn um, that will allow um, the uh, the wearer to to um, actually see better, increase contrast, that sort of thing. And then uh, some of you may have heard about retinal implants, and so these are um, small chips that have been um, implanted into um, into the retina, and in um, in, in these cases, they actually will replace the lost photoreceptors. And so these small chips can actually detect light that is coming in and help to activate the cells in the retina that are still there, that haven't been damaged by the disease. So all that to say that the field of research um, in vision is very exciting um, and very encouraging, and there's lots to be um, optimistic about. But we also have um, a number of challenges that um, that are sort of preventing the, the the fast acceleration of some of these technologies um, into um, into patients, um, and um, some of those some of those challenges are. Um, are not insurmountable. Um, I was very encouraged. I was actually salivating when I was listening to Michelle talking about the situation in Quebec, because certainly um, we don't have those kinds of resources in many other provinces. Um, and so I think we uh, we need to convince our politicians that um, that we do need um, additional resources placed um, in the area of vision research, especially since we have the aging of our population and and. Uh, vision research is going to become a huge um, socioeconomic burden for Canada. I think the last study that was done on uh, the, the cost of blindness um, in Canada was, I believe, in 2007. And at that time, they, had, um, they, they put an estimate of about um, 16 to $17 billion a year that it cost the Canadian economy uh, to deal with vision loss. Um, and that is thought, um, it is thought that this is going to double um, by the year 2030. Um, and so you can imagine that um, the amount of um, the amount of cost for doctors' visits, the amount of lost productivity and lost taxation for the government. And if they don't understand, you know, it, it, even if we can't explain to them what the, the, the social cost of blindness is, perhaps they'll listen if we talk about dollars. Um, and so they need to invest in vision research um, in order to try and, and support people who are dealing with um, these diseases. And also, ultimately, um, it will benefit the Canadian economy. Um, one of the other challenges is, um, as, as Michelle uh, mentioned, is finding a home for our research grants. Um, so the Canadian Institutes of Health Research is where most of us apply for research funding. Um, and as he mentioned, there is no institute for vision research. Um, there is no panel that we can apply for. And so most of us who are doing vision research apply to the neuroscience panels. Um, and the problem with that is that um, they are mostly populated by neuroscientists who don't have a background in vision. So I'll give you an example. Um, I actually sat on one of these panels that evaluates grants. Um, and there were two of us um, in a panel of about 20 scientists that had a background in vision. Um, and we received a number of grants, one of which was on glaucoma. Um, and the glaucoma grant was not given to either one of the vision scientists. It was given to two, two, two neuroscientists to evaluate. And so they gave it a score, but not a fundable score. Because they dealt in diseases of the brain. They didn't have a background on vision. They didn't sort of understand the, the real importance of this grant. And so I had been assigned to just read the grant. I wasn't, I wasn't one of the evaluators. I wasn't one, one of the people that was supposed to give it a score. Um, but when they asked uh, the opinion of the, the whole panel, I sort of put up my hand and I said, I don't, just, I don't agree with the score. Um, the people who are reviewing this grant don't understand how exciting the research that is being proposed in this grant are. And so ultimately what I mean to say by this is that without having a panel that is specifically devoted to vision research, that only has vision scientists on it that can fully understand everything that is proposed in that grant and how exciting potentially the, the, the research in that grant can be, it makes it very difficult to fund vision research. And so 
advocating for um, a panel on CIHR where our grants could go, would go a tremendous way in helping to support more vision research um, in Canada. Um, I don't want to um, you know, take up too much more of your time, but I just want to mention that there are a number of other challenges that we have, and we've briefly touched on it. One is in the support of clinical trials. And so um, even though there are a number of panels, as, as was mentioned, 48 panels um, that are associated with CIHR, there's only one uh, real panel that deals with clinical trials, and those have to do with more advanced trials. So not, not the early stage trials. So those of us who have worked at the bench, who think we have a therapy that would be effective um, in patients, there's not very many places for us to go in order to get that next sort of round of funding in order to progress um, the research. Um, and so it makes it difficult um, to, to really advance from the bench to the patient population um, if we don't know where that pot of funding is going to come from. And, and so then the, and then the other cha challenge is that those of us who do bench work, who have worked with animal models, we know very little about sort of what is the next stage. And so we need to have better uh, supports in place also in order to conduct clinical trials. To know exactly what the, uh, the mechanism is to go from the bench to the bedside. Who we need to bring on side. What kind of expertise we need in order to be able to translate that. And so um, some of our institutions are starting to sort of realize that that's the case and they are starting to, to build um, within, um, for instance, our research institute now has clinical trial specialists, people that will help you to navigate the, the regulatory uh, you know, process in Health Canada, and it's very complicated to try and get your therapy approved. Um, and so we need a little bit more of that. We need support to know exactly who should we be contacting in Health Canada to get to that next stage. Um, what is the expertise that we need in order to fill out all of the forms that are required to get our therapy approved? Um, and so those are the kinds of um, supports, if put in place, that would help to accelerate the number of clinical trials that would, um, that would uh, make it um, into the patient population. And so finally, I just want to end sort of on an encouraging note. Um, I'm, I'm very encouraged by the conversations that we're having over the last couple of days. I think that um, if we can, um, you know, sort of support the FBC to, um, to um, engage our, our um, you know, our government um, in order to um, support vision research and to put these mechanisms in place to increase the clinical trials, then uh, the future of vision research is very bright. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Kathy. I just wanted to share one piece of information and then I'm gonna open up the floor to questions. In uh, 2019, Fighting Blindness Canada did a call for a, a granting competition. And we had four times the number of grant requests than we have ever had in our history. So 73 researchers uh, sent in a letter of intent, 48 made it to the grant application stage, and 21 of those grant applications were deemed meritorious that should be funded. And we were able to challenge our donors. Uh, we thought we could fund five of those grants. We were actually able to do six but we still like to get the other 15 funded. Right, Michelle? <laughs> uh, as the chair of our scientific advisory board that brought in 20 people from around the world to evaluate those grants. So it isn't for lack of questions and it isn't for lack of opportunity, it's for a lack of funding that, uh, that these grants did move forward. So I'd like to open the floor to questions, uh, comments, from the participants, put up your hand, or I'll start just to get the going here. Uh, what do you see as the most promising, that gives you hope every day going into work with your research that you do? Michelle? Well, for me, it's, uh, it's the idea of discovery, right? 
So whenever uh, we go in the lab, we don't know what we're going to find uh, any one day. Uh, so that sometimes the most exciting discoveries come out of, uh, of nowhere, and, uh, and they are not expected. And so the, 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 that moment when you see, you realize that you're seeing something for the first time that nobody has ever seen before, uh, that is giving me uh, a lot of hope, for sure, because that's a new discovery that drives innovation, which then drives treatment later on. So, so it's, yeah, new discoveries. Sorry. It's still muted. Yeah, yeah that's what I thought. <laughs> 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 now I'm not going to repeat all of what I said. <laughs> okay, no, okay. Because I, I probably won't remember what I just said. <laughs> Stuart? You all heard, right? Okay. Uh, so is mine on? Yes. It is. Okay. Uh, so say the question again. So I'm just asking what, what inspires you every day with the research that you do? Oh, gosh. Gives you uh, hope. There's a number of things. Um, uh, First of all, this has been my passion. I, I have wanted nothing more than to um, be able to capture the lived experience of all Canadians with disabilities and to know that the data that we provide, that the research that we do, does have a meaningful impact in terms of making changes or shaping changes to policies and programs. Because what we can do is we take the anecdotal that persons with disabilities may already know about their lived experience, and we quantify it, we give it a number. We tell you how many people live with this experience in Canada. We also quantify um, those experiences. And I don't mean quantify in the sense of minimizing what those experiences are for each one of us individually, but to say something collectively as a group that these are the issues that have a real big impact on Canadians with disabilities, and then to look at you know, how is, it, how is that different for different types of disabilities? So uh, part of my work, and I, and I think I'll, I'll build on what you're saying, is, is the excitement of discovery. The, the things that I find most interesting are the things that I scratch my head on and I go, well, that doesn't make sense. And then it, it, it compels me to look into the data more to see if I can come up with an explanation. So it's that discovery of finding. In there. So I can say for all those reasons that um, you know this is this is the career that I've always wanted, and I enjoy it. So thank you, Kathy. So it gives me hope. Um, is my, my microphone's on? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so I have been involved in research in one form or another. Um, so in vision research for about 20 years, but in research in one form or another for. Oh my gosh, I'm going to date myself now. Um, it's been about 35 years um, since I finished my, uh, my undergrad degree and started uh, my graduate studies. And it, what gives me hope is the incredible, um, incredible progress that we have made in those 35 years. 35 years ago, um, we um, had to sort of build everything from scratch. There were no resources that were available for research. Um, something which today um, can happen almost instantaneously would take a week to do 35 years ago. Um, and, and this incredible explosion in research has really sort of become evident um, even in the past five or 10 years. And so I have seen just how um, exponentially uh, research has grown, um, how the capability of the stuff that, that we're doing um, has, has basically accelerated, um, and I'm very excited about what's going to happen in the next five years, because given what we've achieved in vision research over the, the past five years, and the fact that technologies are getting more and more sophisticated, I am really confident that there is going to be major changes happening um, in the next five years, and I'm excited to see what those changes are going to be. Thank you. You have a question? There's a microphone coming. Is there a role for, I mean, a lot of this research obviously is done with, you know, animal models and things like that, but is there a role for um, artificial intelligence by using, you know, vast amounts of data, metadata across the world uh, to, you know, run simulations in terms of uh, vision research right across right across the board and the uh, my, the b part of my question is 
Um, in terms of coordination of research across the world, how do you accomplish that? How do you leverage um, research that is being done in other countries? How do you know what's being done in, in other countries in a real to on re real time basis, so that there isn't any duplication of uh, of efforts? Kathy, I can I can sure I mean. Uh, uh, artificial intelligence um, definitely is coming up, uh, more so on the diagnostic side. Uh, so there's a, a lot of work being done right now to use artificial intelligence to uh, diagnose retinal disease uh, at early stages, uh, automatically using a, a, a artificial intelligence in ways that cannot be done by a human eye right now. Uh, so diagnostic is definitely going to improve, I think. Uh, on, on designing research, uh, that remains to be seen. Uh, I think there will always be a need for um, originality and, and human brain involvement in this, but certainly there's a lot of people trying to develop all sorts of projects around artificial intelligence, so that's certainly uh, coming up and there's more and more people using it. Um, in terms of, of what, how we know what's going on, it's easy, there's publications, uh, they are available online, and, and every time we have a new research finding, uh, that's how we survive as scientists in academia, is to publish our results, because this is how we are evaluated on whether or not we've made progress. Uh, and so we publish this, these results in, in international journals that are available online to, for everyone to see, including you. If you want to search for my name on Google, you'll find a bunch of articles that we've published that, that you can read. So that's how other people know what we do. And, uh, and also there's obviously a uh, research conference that we attend and we go and talk to other people on, in person as well. Um, I'd just like to also add, uh, the Association for Research in Vision and Ophthalmology is, a, is an international body. It has 12,000 vision researchers in 78 countries. It held its annual scientific conference in Vancouver in 2019, and uh, they give out five awards. One of those awards is for an up-and-comer, so the young, the young researcher that's got potential. So to be a young researcher, that means you have to be under 45, just to make that point. Uh, and, and we're very proud that uh, one of our Fighting Blindness Canada researchers, Mike Safaya at the University of Montreal, was, was recognized by the world as being an up-and-comer who's already making an international difference and has uh, quite inspiring research underway that, that appears around the world. We're aware of that research and had recognized his potential of making an impact uh, throughout the rest of his career. So there is many, many ways, uh, and this association, the ARVO, as it says, the acronym, uh, is one of those ways that international research is, uh, is happening. And of course, being that it was in Vancouver, we, in the, the beginning of May, uh, we made quite a splash within the Canadian research field, sharing our work on the international stage. Quickly, this is another thing that gives us hope, right? Is the new generation. I mean, I, I may look young, but I, I <laughs> apparently, who told me this morning I look young? Uh, but, uh, but I'm getting old in terms of research uh, capacity. The real next generation of scientists is, is are the graduate students and the postdoctoral fellows that are working in the labs today. They are the people who will drive whatever, you know, new research is, is happening now, they will drive that into treatment later on. So, and they are, they are really fantastic, and there's a lot of promising uh, people out there. So it's really exciting and hopeful. The question, Albert? Just get the mic. Um, going, back to the, going back to the statistics, uh, do we include in the uh, disability survey uh, the issues that we heard about during Vision Quest yesterday where diet, exercise, um, and, and that sort of thing, is that evaluated along with disability and the severity of? I'm just going to take that because I make sure that I've understood what you asked. 
is what you're asking is in the, uh, the most recent 2017 CSD, uh, did we have questions that asked specifically about a um, person's uh, health lifestyles? So things like um, their diet and level of exercise. Is, is that, am I correct in understanding that that's what you're asking? That is correct. Okay. Um, uh, I think that, that's, actually, uh, that's a, actually a great um, uh, question to raise. Um, I don't believe, and I'm, I'm looking at my, my team as well, that we cover it, but you've touched on something that I think is actually really important for us to get on our radar, because one of the things that we're hoping to do here um, is to take advantage of the fact that what are the data gaps that we are missing in, in this cycle of the survey that we may potentially be able to add into future ones. And so just by you raising it now is telling me that, okay, we, that hasn't been something we haven't, that we've touched on yet, but that's not something that we couldn't discuss with the team as something that could be possibly added to it um, because we, we know that that content is also very interesting and it would be interesting to see if we can do comparisons for those um, not only by different disability types, including vision, but how does that compare against the general population? So all of these things are great things for us to take back with us as potential things that we can add in the 2022. So thank you for raising it. So at this point, I'd like to say thank you to our panelists. Uh, of course, on fightingblindness.ca 2020-summit, uh, there is this paper about supporting vision research and the questionnaire where you could provide feedback, continuing to provide feedback to our white paper to make sure that we capture the key issues and any solutions that you want to add to the dialogue. We are going to be publishing the final versions of our three papers during Glaucoma Week, uh, the week of March 9th in Canada. So I appreciate taking a moment and please share your thoughts. We deeply appreciate having that feedback. We'll t pause for five minutes and then Louise will come up and start our next panel. Thank you.